So let's return now to the Doomsday Cult Mom trial, where we've been hearing about the digital trail of evidence from a former FBI agent. We want to go straight to our own Court TV legal correspondent, Chanley Painter. Always great to see you. A happy Friday to you. But an unhappy case that you're listening to in terms of the horrificness of the evidence, of the testimony. Tell us about what testimony the jury actually heard today. Well, they heard a half day's testimony from the lead FBI special agent, Doug Hart, who his one of his many jobs was to examine the two iCloud accounts of Lori Vallow Daybell, thousands of text messages that he organized in a timeline. And so the jury seeing um, from the time that Chad and Lori met up until around July 2019, as the morning ended and the jury was sent home for a long weekend, uh, they were seeing some of these messages between the two. and. In and ultimately, what we learned, and we haven't really gotten to these messages yet, Ashley, is that according to this FBI agent, is that there are communications about the deaths of Tylee, JJ, Charles, and Tammy between Chad and Lori. So those will be some big revelations on Monday when he picks up his testimony. But let's look at what he did read to the jury today. It culminated with some salacious messages between Chad and Lori when only a couple of days after Charles Vallow was shot by Alex Cox, Chad is sending this message on July 14th to Lori Vallow Daybell saying, good morning, my most beautiful Lily. Thanks for for joining me in the shower this morning. Wow, I love you so immensely that the whole universe knows it and very soon the people on this little blue globe will know it too. Also on that same day, Chad texts, I need so badly to just gently kiss you for hours. It would likely lead to other activities, likely or luckily, Lori responds, and Chad says it would luckily lead to nakedness. Now, I was trying to gauge some of the reactions of the jury and those in the room on the gallery. Uh, definitely had a little mumble jumbled uh, <laughs> reaction to some of these messages. And uh, while the story, and it goes on to read some of the story of James and Elena that also Chad sent to Lori on that same day, uh, one of the jurors, male jurors, actually was kind of looking and kind of went, like this with his eyes and then kind of went like this <laughs> at jurors table uh, during that moment but that's not all this jury was actually able to see the reaction to Charles Vallow's death just best you know rewind a couple days before these messages uh, you know Charles was shot by Alex Cox and the jury was seeing how cold Lori handled communicating that message to Charles two oldest sons Zach and Cole Vallow and on a message July 15th uh, after not hearing from Lori uh, for three days she just texts them and says you know your father Charles Vallow has passed away she doesn't know much more information than that she ghosts them and then so here we have this message saying okay Lori it's been three days you let us know our father passed away over a text message the only information we have is that one text from you saying he passed and you disappeared after that are there any funeral plans and can Zach and I be part of it we talked to him all the time and now he's gone we need any information you have what happened when did it happen how did it happen where is he now I, t I t called Colby recently too, but he didn't answer. Is JJ safe? And what does he know? I need to be kept in the loop about all of this. Jurors taking a plethora of notes for these messages. And then one final thing that they were able to learn from this witness so far is that uh, he found within the communications on Lori's iCloud how she uh, and Chad had this almost equal power of position within their followers. It was as if they would come to Lori and go to Chad for revelations in their own lives, especially Alex Cox. Uh, but Doug Hart also says that Lori's position was right next to Chad Daybell. The two of them were in an elevated position and others would seek their counsel and advice as it related to alleged revelations, visions, and so forth. So again, going to, we're hearing about uh, money, power, and sex from these prosecutors through these text messages today. Also, even pointing to some, uh, we haven't seen the messages yet, but this investigator saying that there's messages specifically talking about financial motive as well, Ashley. So this is a lot of information that really is culminating this uh, this evidence for jurors at what likely would be the wrap of the state's case. And a lot of evidence. I mean, Chanley, finally, it's kind of putting together those final threads to say why they've charged Lori Vallodeba with actually murder and conspiracy yeah. to commit murder, but where the evidence is. All right, Chanley, tell us if you would first, what's going to happen next week in this trial? 
Next week, we expect, of course, prosecution's case to roll on. The investigator from the FBI, Doug Hart, will retake the stand. And, and again, with all of these messages, he will likely be the full day of prosecution uh, testimony, given that he's going uh, meticulously through these uh, messages. Uh, he would have been have a cross-examination. And we will see what the state does next. Will they call more witnesses? Uh, will they arrest at some point early next week? And will it be the defense's turn at some point next week to put on a case? Today, Lori in court, Ashley, because I know you always ask me, uh, she was wearing, again, her baby blue blouse. She was more serious today at times. But I have to say, during some of these text messages being read, she would twice nod her head no in disagreement as if the conclusion about the text message according to the investigator was wrong. And she sits in front of the jury, so the jurors definitely can take her reaction in uh, throughout. All right. Thank you. You knew I was going to ask that. You're absolutely right. I know that you're <laughs> going to need to go, but one more question. I just want to find out. Can you tell us anything about Chad Daybell's status hearing that happened yesterday? Yeah, that was a big hearing. In fact, Chad was in the room, but on the big Zoom screen. Uh, he had a white shirt, red tie. He looked like a statue. He barely moved the whole time he was on the screen. But for blinking his eyes, I really didn't realize uh, he was so he was with us. But they uh, they went back and forth over a trial date, and here's how it ended. Let's watch. We were just trying to determine if a May date would work for the state. It sounds like at least one of the prosecutors does have an event towards the end of May that would not be able to be rescheduled and has been set for some time. I don't know if there's a way that we could consider starting in June as opposed to May uh, to avoid that potential issue if the court is considering May. We may not agree on everything or anything, quite frankly, but in terms of trying to process some of the exhibits and everything else, it may be wise to do June so that we go and we start and, and with all respect to Mr. Archibald and the other parties in this case, uh, it might be slightly cleaner if we do it starting in June. All right, I'll just take all that under advisement. So the judge didn't settle on an exact trial date for Chad Daybell's death penalty trial, but it seems as though both sides are in agreement that it should be next year, possibly June 2024. Prosecutors want 12 weeks. Uh, the defense wants, I mean, sorry, the defense wants 12 weeks. The prosecutors want eight. So we shall see what the judge actually does, Ashley. All right, Chanley, thank you so much, as always, for your great reporting. Stay warm there in Boise. I want to now welcome my guests for this hour, former criminal defense attorney Kirk Nurmi and former federal prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Attorney Duncan Levin, and I love that I have both sides here represented, former prosecutor and the defense attorney. And I want to know this. Let me start with you, if I could, please, Duncan. Do you think that so far, knowing there's a little more evidence to come, that the state has set out enough evidence to meet all of the required elements to prove murder against Lori Vallow Daybell for her two children's deaths? Not yet. I don't think so, because we have such important testimony coming next week. What's happening on Monday is going to be huge. You know, everybody has their little secrets and their text messages, and that's what we're about to hear. And frankly, I think what the prosecution's been doing is a little um, cheeky, to be honest, because what they're doing is they're dribbling it out over a period of several days and leaving all of the really pertinent, relevant stuff for Monday, but they're letting the jurors sit all weekend with basically the sex, drugs, and rock and roll of the case, which is these you know, um, you know, kind of sex between Chad and Lori and all this other innuendo. All of that stuff, frankly, is really not that relevant at all. I think they're laying the scene and they're going to wait. And I think if you ask me that question again at the same time on Monday, I bet you the answer is yes. Oh, wow, Duncan, that's interesting. And you're right. Bringing all that stuff out and the sexting, that really gets to the emotions of the jurors. All right, former criminal defense attorney Kirk Nurmi, let me ask you that same question. Do you think the prosecution has met its burden yet to prove murder beyond a reasonable doubt? I definitely think it's the case with the conspiracy counts. And, and like Duncan, I'm, I'm kind of like three quarters of the way there as it relates to the murder count. I mean, the big smoking gun, if you will, when we talk about the murder counts is that that hair that was found on the adhesive that was unfortunately and tragically wrapped around uh, the victim's neck. But ultimately, I do think, you know, this evidence is relevant to that murder charge because while it's juicy and salacious, I think it helps paint the picture. And I think 
think it helps show motive because it shows what they really wanted, what they were really trying to, the, the kids were a burden to their sexual lifestyle, this new life they wanted to lead, whether it be in consistence with their prophecies or their own lust, I don't know, but I think it gets us that much closer to not only understanding the conspiracy, but the motive for the murders themselves. Right, the motive, we know that's not an element, but every jury wants to know why. It helps to have a motive, you can at least argue if you're the state.